actually nanoscale size pores in a thin membrane. It can be a solid state membrane, which means a silicon dioxide or silicon nitride membrane, and uh, or it can be a protein membrane. So alpha hemolysine channel, which are ion channels, actually are found in a biological uh, environment. So those ion channels uh, can be used as a nanopore, and so for that you have to make actually a lipid bilayer. So this is a lipid bilayer which you also find in a cell membrane, and then you can, with a, some protocol, you can insert uh, this uh, biological nanopore into this membrane, and then you can put electrode on one side, both sides, and then the sDNA passes through. You can get some pulses from there, <clears throat> and those nanopores can also be fabricated using a uh, TM and uh, or FIB focus ion beam based setting. So I would did went through it uh, previously, so I'm just skipping that slide. But the whole idea is to do DNA analysis and protein analysis, but uh, when nanopores are started, the major goal was actually to sequence the DNA. So it's one of a uh, sequence technology, and uh, I, yesterday when I was preparing for a lecture, actually I went through the Oxford Nanopore website, and they have a, they have a tremendous amount of improvement, so now they're some of their equipment which they are selling is commercially available. Um, so the device itself is this much size, like a, about a few centimeter long and maybe a couple of centimeter wide. So and that you can use for sequencing. If you have a, a sample prepared, if you put it there, I think you should be able to sequence it. And it can read a long uh, DNA lens. So means uh, one DNA, it can read longer DNAs as compared to the other methods. So. Uh, there is a biological nanopore, right? But uh, there also um, uh, there are other alternatives, uh, which are uh, solid-state nanopores. Uh, the benefit of solid-state nanopores uh, is that we can play with the uh, with the salinity of a solution or a pH of a solution, because for protein nanopores, it has to be very specific conditions. Uh, but for solid state nanopores, they are very stable. Um, uh, you can uh, use them at a very high temperature also because they are stable. As compared to protein nanopores, they ha you have to use a very typical uh, room temperature, 37 degrees temperature range. But even this, if it's this uh, nanopore is built in silicon dioxide, for example, silicon nitride, which are very commonly used materials, so you can. Uh, use them even at 500 degrees centigrade because the material is stable at that temperature. So, so that's a, one of the reasons people are more interested. And then secondly, um, uh, there is interest in parallelization because scalability of the things, because of the solid state nanopores, um, you can uh, make many pores. You can make an array of pores in a membrane, thin membrane. Let's say one pore is 10, 5 nanometer. So you can have one, two, three, four, and if you know if you have a good method, you can have actually thousands of pores on a small area, and uh, and then each pore can be addressable with electrodes. So in that way, the scalability is much easier. So it seems easier in a solid state nanopore, and stability is much better. But normally, um, that's the plus side. On the negative side, the solid state nanopores are. A bit more noise. Um, uh, they, they, they are not always the same size. Let's say if you drill a five nanometer pore, it will not be always five nanometer. It can be 5.5, 5, 6, 3, 4, like it can be in that range, but cannot be perfectly the same size. So, which is one limitation. But in the case of protein nanopores, which are biological counterparts, they are really same size. If you said it's two nanometer on this side and three nanometer on the other side, so it will be. 2 and 3 nanometer always, because this is how the protein folds to make um, this channel. So, so it, it, the size are very important. So that also, um, uh, so by using a biological number, you always get a similar background noise most of the time, as compared to uh, with the solid state nanopore, you you can have a different uh, background. And then the charges, if you're using silicon nitride or silicon dioxide or alumina oxide or L two or three different membranes are used for making nanopores, then your background is always changing. So that's the one limitation. So the nanopores, uh, I asked one question, I think, in the midterm, and also 
uh, yeah, I think in the midterm I asked uh, the application of Nanopore. So one was very simple for sequencing. Some people just said, oh, this can be used for biological applications. That's it. So that was not the answer. So I want, I know that it has, it can be used for biological applications. Uh, but you have to really specify what exactly. And for the midterm, um, I was expecting there be a better answer because if you search Nanopore, you will find even if you read a Wikipedia or any article, you would be it was very easy to find the applications. <sighs> One student mentioned can be used for cellular tumor cells. Um, uh, I don't know why because the pores are the cells are larger in size, about a 10 micrometer, and the pore is about just a five nanometer. So this cannot be used for that purpose. I don't think so. Uh, so I think there was some uh, lack in understanding about the pore and its uses. So uh, so basically uh, the nanopore is used for normally sensing nanoscale uh, uh, targets, which can be DNA. Uh, you can sequence the length of DNA. Uh, you can also see a DNA and complementary interaction if something is binding or not. And I'll give you one other example. Actually, we previously also discussed that if there is one base mismatch between the target and the one which you have immobilized inside a pore, then you will see different kind of uh, translocation events. Like they, they, when they pass through it, your pulse shapes are different. So in that way, you can differentiate if the uh, target is perfect complementary to the immobilized uh, single strand or is it or there is a single mismatch so you can find that out it can also be used to uh, uh, to analyze the proteins because the proteins have different shapes once they pass through it uh, you would expect a different signal um, and so it can be used for protein analysis so it's label free so you don't really need any label to tag proteins and all that so it can also be used for um, DNA and protein interaction. So there is one thing is called the aptamers, DNA aptamers or RNA aptamers. So those are just small strands of, let's say, 20 or 30 or 40 base pair long uh, DNA strand or RNA strand, and they they are called aptamers. Do you know what for what purpose aptamers are used? Anyone? For what purpose RNA or DNA aptamers are used? Biosensors, Bio yeah, but sensing. So, so yeah, it's used in sensors. So, what what exactly it does? Does it bind with the target or what? It binds with the protein. So, um, people have actually discovered that some DNA fragments of specific length and sequence they show very specific binding with certain targets, and it's very selective. Uh, people don't know exactly why that happens, uh, that why some DNA which judges for bases, why certain sequence uh, show very really specific binding to different proteins, but, um, uh, but, but the reality is that there's some fragments which are called aptamers, they do show binding and they are used very often nowadays in a place of antibodies. So normally in the biosensor we use antibodies uh, and that will capture the proteins of interest or antigens of interest. Uh, but now people are also uh, uh, designing aptamers, which are small single strand DNA or um, RNA fragments, which can bind with the uh, uh, protein. So, and, and there are some properties of aptamers uh, which people think is better than the antibodies. Um, um, but but they are used uh, it's in active area of research, and aptamers are also thoroughly research for applications as a um, as a therapy, a biotherapy, so they can go and bind with the different cancer, like same way as antibodies were used. So they are now also research for that purpose. Like you can functionalize your particle with certain aptamer which can bind with the cancer cell, for example, it can go inside. So it can specifically target uh, the cancer cells or other cells of interest. Uh, like that. So it can be used for aptamer and protein interaction also, the nanopores. So when protein is passing through, for example, and if you attach aptamer inside, so it will um, it will bind with it. Uh, it will, we can find out if it is showing binding with the protein or not. 
Okay, and and then in when we talk about the solid state nanopores, um, uh, there are different methods which are used to make a solid state nanopore. So one of the methods, so most of the methods, uh, they use a uh, um, isotropic and isotropic etching when they etch it this way and then they make a membrane. I think there was also one question, so now you know how to make that membrane. So once you have a thin membrane, now you can drill holes in the membrane. Either you can put another mask and uh, which should, which can be E-beam based, so you can make a small pore there, but that's not very common. So some people uh, use some etchants and put electrodes on both sides and, and try to etch a membrane such that uh, whenever there is a, uh, some current passing through, it means the pore is open and they can stop the uh, etching there. So that's another way, but, but mostly people use a, a focus ion beam or a, a, a TM, a focus electron beam, uh, to actually uh, focus the beam of electrons and ion on a small area on a membrane, so that will uh, uh, fluidize the uh, membrane that area and then it make a hole there. So during this process you can also see if the pore is getting formed or not. And and then the, once you get the pore, <coughs> it means you drill the pore actually, and uh, that's the most common method used. Once you drill a pore, then now you can also tweak its size, you can make it smaller, and how they do it, they again expose that area where there's a pore with a high energetic beam and and then that makes that softens the silicon dioxide silicon nitride uh, and in that way the pore started to shrink uh, uh, in a smaller size uh, so you can shrink the pore you can also make it large by using a very high beam so it will be another drilling kind of a step but in this process normally you can work only with the um, one pore at a one time because you are using focus beam so you cannot like if you have membrane as a thousand pores for example so you cannot shrink all thousand pores at one time. Um, so we also worked at um, uh, this nanopore shrinking uh, uh, previously where we thought, okay, if we have to provide energy to a membrane, then uh, we have, we, we maybe we can um, provide energy in terms of uh, heat because uh, at high temperature, about 1200 or 1300, the uh, silicon dioxide uh, start getting uh, fluidized, so it softens, it doesn't melt because the melting temperature is about 16, 1700. So at that temperature it softens and that allows the surface tension to re rearrange the periphery and it might um, start to shrink. So, and then with that goal we, um, we make some pores in the membranes. Let's say, in this case, this pore is about 100, uh, I don't know, uh, two, 300 nanometer. And then then after a shrink, so what we did is we actually exposed it to different temperatures, 500, um, uh, 1250, 1150. We try different temperatures and see how it's closing or not closing. And we noticed that um, at a certain temperature and with the time, the pores starting getting closing. So at the end, you can see here, so this pore, for example, is about 15 nanometer. And this pore is, you can see the pore in the middle. So that is a, a silicon dioxide membrane in which we made a pore. So this is about uh, 4 nanometer approximately. So in that way, um, so the benefit of this method was that you can, if you have thousands of pores and if you have maybe 100 devices, you can shrink all of them in a furnace. So the process was much simpler. So in this example, it shows if you use very high temperature, let's say 50 to 1250 degrees centigrade. So we notice even in just four minutes, uh, the pore was fully closed. So it means the very high temperature was not very efficient in this case. Um, another example, we use a 1150 degrees centigrade. So at the start, uh, it was 350 nanometer. After 15 minutes, we noticed that it actually started increasing in size, not shrinking down. So. And so that we noticed that when uh, sometime pore shrinks and sometime it size start increasing, and that depends on the ratio between the initial pore and the thickness of the membrane. So if the initial pore is big and membrane is thin, so then when you soften the membrane because of the surface tension, the the pore started to get larger. So, but when a membrane is very thick and the starting pore is small and the membrane is thick, 
and when the, at that time then when you apply soft transit it start to shrink uh, it, it start to close because of a surface tension how it so it, it, it is more stable when it start getting closed so you see that so by controlling the thickness of membrane you can choose when you want to increase the pore size or decrease the pore size more details you can find in the paper which is cited here so normally in nanopore measurements you have um, so let's say we have a pore hair chip hair which is one pore shown in a green in this uh, uh, image and uh, then you have uh, two gaskets which are just a pdms or some plastics to uh, to just uh, uh, to put this chip in this setup so that can avoid any leakage because this chip is um, the chip is made up of a wafer so if it's very um, uh, stiff so you cannot really uh, pack it in, in uh, between these two chambers so we need to use some gaskets there and then you apply you put two electrodes this solution is KCO potassium chloride and uh, and that's it you apply voltage you put a DNA on one side so then it will let the DNA to pass through the other side you should be start getting a pores so uh, start getting a current so in this case um, uh, the solid state nanopore so I think before going further let me just show you a small video I think I can find it quickly uh, Okay, let's watch this one so it will give you some idea. Uh, which one is the latest one? There are quite a few videos. For DNA sequencing, intact DNA strands are processed by the nanopores and can be analyzed in real time. The nanopore sequences the fragments that are presented to it regardless of their length, rather than generating reads of a specific length. This could be reads of hundreds of kilobases or more. Nanopore long reads simplify assembly and sequencing of repetitive regions, also improving the speed of species identification in metagenomic experiments. So what happens during nanopore sequencing? The DNA strands to be sequenced are mixed with copies of a processive enzyme, shown here in green. As the DNA enzyme complexes approach the nanopore, the single-stranded DNA is pulled through the aperture. The enzyme ratchets the DNA strand through the nanopore one base at a time. The speed of the enzyme can be controlled. More data is yielded per second the faster the enzyme runs, but with no deterioration in accuracy. As the DNA moves through the pore, the combination of nucleotides and the strand being processed creates a characteristic disruption in the electrical current. This nanopore signal can be used to determine the order of bases on that DNA strand. Nanopores have processed read lengths of hundreds of kilobases, and when a nanopore has processed a complete read, it will start a new one. Nanopores start to stream data as soon as the experiment begins with base calling taking place locally. Users can also take advantage of epitome workflows for real-time analysis, continuing the experiment until sufficient data has been analyzed to determine the answer to a biological question. With nanopore sequencing, the user has the ability to run the experiment until the answer is reached, rather than working to an arbitrary instrument runtime. The workflow described here is adaptable and is used to sequence a variety of molecules in real time, including genomic DNA, amplified genomic DNA, and PCR amplicons. In the same way that native DNA can be analyzed, RNA can be sequenced in its native form or by using cDNA. For more information, please visit nanoportech.com. Okay, I'll stop there. <clears throat> so, you'll see that one application where um, you can watch, I think they have more stuff, and there will be one, I, I'm actually thinking to give you one homework, which will be homework four, uh, related with the nanopores, and I'll let you know in a minute what will be the homework about. Okay, now in, in this video they have used the biological nanopores and that's what they are selling, but you can also make a solid state nanopores. And we did talk about these parameters, the temperature, chemical treatment, pH, and salinity of the, the um, biological uh, solid state nanopores are more stable uh, 
uh, and but then we cannot really control their sizes as uh, perfectly as the biological nanopore. So these are some limitations or advantages of one technology than the other. So when DNA passes through the pore, um, we s normally get a, some pulses. So we get a dip in a current, and uh, because it's blocking the pore, right? Um, but the pulse, people also notice that sometimes that pulses which you are getting are um, not downwards because normally it blocks the pore and then you get a blockage like you get a pulse means you get pore blockage so less current can pass through the pore and then the current reading would be lower so you will get a lower current but but sometimes people also notice that when DNA passes through it, actually they get a pulses which are upwards. And um, and then they looked into why we're getting upward pulses. And then they noticed that, especially at the low molarity, when the salt uh, concentration is low, you have less, less potassium or chlorine ions in the solution. At that time, the, the pulse, which is actually uh, because of a, uh, DNA translocation through the pore, is dependent on the counter ions means the potassium and chlorine ions, which are passing, one is going towards the positive electrode, the other is going towards the negative electrode, a K and C L. And and then it depends on that. That will make a baseline current. But when the uh, DNA physically blocks blocks the pore, so when it blocks the pore, then it means you will get a dip in that current, right? Let's say first you're getting some current and then you get a dip in the current because of a physical blockage. But there's another important thing that DNA itself is also a charge. It has a negative charge. Let's say if you have a three, 300 base pair long or um, DNA. So when it is passing through, it is also carrying some charge from one chamber to the other chamber, right? So because carrying a charge is also, um, uh, it's also contributing to the current flow. So basically, DNA itself, the movement of DNA from one chamber to the other chamber is also contributing to the current flow. So that's why it's also important to consider that. And that was the reason that sometimes when the molarity is much lower, uh, then when the DNA passes through it, let's say, so this is the DNA, when it passes through it, it takes more charge to the other side because of the DNA, then it blocks it. So basically, Without a DNA, so there is some current flow, and when DNA passes through, it because of the DNA itself, because it's charged, it's taking more charge to the other chamber as, comp as compared to how much it's blocking. So in that case, you will be getting actually pulses which are upwards. That means your current will increase slightly when DNA is passing through. And that's what people have noticed, and there are some publications about it also, about this mechanism. And sometimes, yes? How do they identify the base pairs? That will be your question, actually, uh, for homework. So the idea is, I will show you, there, there is some background which I'll show you in a minute, like to some extent, how this technology, so these are some of the issues related with the nanopore. We can get lower pulses, up pulses, and there is also some rectification effect which you see. Uh, but uh, but after that, um, I'll give you some details about how nanopore works and how what people have done. And then the question would be how exactly the technology is working, which they have right now in the commercially available. Okay, that would be a question. Okay, so yes. Do you say when there's a less, when I mean, you have less concentration of DNA, there's more current? So when there's less concentration of um, uh, the salt solution, let's say potassium um, chloride KCl, let's say you have you are not one molar, you are using 0 0.01 molar. So at that time, the charge is so you have less number of potassium and chlorine ions which are contributing to current flow. But now the DNA is more charged as compared to the background. So when DNA passes through, it means you are carrying more charge from one terminal from one side to the other side, so you get more actually current as compared to how much is blocking. So there is also another effect, it's called the rectification effect. People notice that um, when you start increasing, uh, so what is the rectification or saturation effect? So rectification is that, anyone from engineering can tell me what is diode rectification or AC signal rectification? Yeah, making AC signal into DC signal. So basically what does it mean? Uh, in case of AC signal, we have positive and negative 
Yeah. So when you have a AC signal like this, the it can be voltage up front. And if you put a diode here, so if you don't understand it, that's fine. So this diode is a device which you can rectify. And it's called the half wave rectification. So what it does, it only allows the current to pass through uh, one side. So negative pulses will not pass through, for example, in this case. Uh, and uh, so basically, if I draw it here, so if there is a voltage and current, when you have positive voltage, it will allow the current to pass through. But on the negative side, when it's a negative side, it will not allow it to pass through. Okay, it will stay at zero. So something like that. On the only it will show it will pass the when you apply voltage, it will allow only current to pass through on the positive side. When you apply negative voltage, it will not allow it to pass through. So that's a rectification. Um, so in the nanopore, people also see rectification signals. So and also saturation. So what they have noticed that uh, when you apply voltage and you look at the pulses, which is I pulse, how much current is passing through. Uh, they notice that after some time it saturates actually, that's the one thing. And they also notice that at certain voltages, then uh, the signal which you are getting actually is, uh, uh, so it's not a real re rectification, but you, st you see some rectification. This is also rectification, not fully rectification. The full rectification will be when there is nothing passing through. But in this case, there is still some current passes through it, and then it saturates after some time. So it, at one time, at one positive potential, it actually allows more current to pass through, and the other terminal it doesn't allow. And why that happens, and that process is similar to rectification, and why that happens in the nanopores. Um, that's very important to consider all these uh, mechanisms because then later on, when you're looking at the pulses, so you know what pulse, from where you're getting those pulses and effects in the pulses. So in this case, let's say we have a DNA, which is now shown with the blue line, which negative and negative is shown the backbone phosphate, and then you have, it is, because it's a negative, so you will expect in a solution if it's a potassium colloride, so it will be screened or covered with the uh, K plus ions, right? It will shield the uh, uh, DNA. And when, so this is positive and this is negative, so when it p moves towards the positive side, so then you will see that the potassium ions cannot actually, so while the DNA is passing through, the potassium ions will also move with the DNA, right? But after, when it's getting close to the positive chamber, then the potassium ions cannot stay there because of uh, applied potential. So they have to stay, keep, stay in uh, negative side. So they move, start moving towards the left or toward the right in this case yeah so they start moving towards the right so basically as dna is passing through the the shielding effect start getting reduced and now these potassium ions can block the pore so basically you will get some current and after that it can block the pore while it's passing through and it happens when the dna is long because then you have a lot of potassium ions inside the channel right so that will physically block any further movement of the charges it will not allow any more positive uh, charges to pass through because they're already filled with those potassium ions and that uh, uh, charges can affect the the pulses so it means you cannot really read very long dna also in this case but much longer than how the illumina and the other technologies works then the one limitation of the um, a solid state nanopore is that uh, you cannot think about the basis. Let's look at this diagram. So let's look at so how many base pairs are these? 500 base pair double stranded DNA. 500 base pairs. If you look at the pulse which you are getting, in this case, from this paper, the pulse width is about how much? Approximately. Five millisecond, right? So because the total, if this scale is ten, so this would be pulse width. This is pulse um, dip. Okay. So the or we can also call this time from here to here pulse width or cross location time. Okay. And this is normally called the magnitude of a pulse or the pulse dip. So different names are used. So basically, in this case, the cross location time or pulse width is about five millimeter milliseconds. So it means if 500 bases, the pulse width is only 5 milliseconds. 
So how many bases, um, so what is the time to pass one base? Five nano. I sure five nano. Five, so it will be five thousand microseconds. Five thousand microseconds divided by five hundred. It's a it's a ten, right? It's a ten ten microseconds. Ten microseconds. Five milliseconds divided by five hundred. Five hundred, yes. So ten microseconds. So it means each base is passing through it in just ten uh, ten microseconds. So it means in one second you'll have ten over five bases will pass through it. So you need a very acquisition equipment like you really have to read it at very high sampling rate. And normally equipment works pretty well in kilohertz range, means you can look at 1,000 samples in one second. But when you have to, in this case, in one second, you have to read, let's say, 10 per 5 or 10 per 6 basis, okay? So you need a 1 megahertz uh, sampling rate. And at that sampling rate, you also get a lot of noise from the electronic equipment. So um, that may be a little bit difficult for you to understand for some people, but, but the idea is that it's passing through it very, very quickly. Uh, and that is difficult to sense it at a, such a high sampling rate and efficiently. You can still sense it, but then you get a lot of noise from the electronic itself, and that noise actually can, uh, you cannot really see each base uh, separated from another base. So, because the DNA is passing through very quickly. So, if that's the case, then how we can, so there, what can be strategies to actually uh, move the DNA slowly. So one example, which is perfect, is that you put an enzyme there, right? So there, there's some special enzyme they created that only allows the DNA to unwind to a single strand, base by base, right? So in that we can control the movement of DNA through the pore, right? So if it is only allowing one base open and then it moves, another moves, like the video I showed you, so in that way, you can move the, uh, you can control the movement of the DNA, right? So in that way, you don't need to worry about the speed. The other things people are trying or tried is actually um, changing the surface charge of the pore, solid state pore. They make it more positive. So when DNA is passing through, it's a negative charge. So it'll try to stay there inside the pore a little bit longer because of a charge. So in that way, you can hold it. Uh, so. The other idea was that you can also put enzyme there. When the DNA is coming, it will cut the base one by one. So, it, so let's say long, long is coming. When is when the enzyme is enzyme is fixed on the top of the pore. So when DNA tries to pass through it, the enzyme cuts it, cleaves the base. So when it cleaves the base, it means then only one base can pass through at one time. And uh, in that way, there will be a gap between the bases. Okay, there was a method which people looked into. I think it was not very successful because still the bases were getting mixed and they were not getting a very um, identifiable signal. Uh, but let's going back to another, um, let's talk about a little bit other things that how, uh, I'll get back to the previous point, but basically they also tried, the, definitely with the potential, how much voltage you're applying. If you reduce the voltage, you can also control the speed of the DNA, right? If you, let's say, instead of applying one volt across the electrode, if you apply 0.1 volt, so then the less potential uh, will be on a charge, so then DNA will pass a little bit slowly. But you cannot apply really low voltage because then you might not get a signal from there. So, um, and then they also notice that if they can control viscosity of a solution, because if it's very viscous, then it can you can control also the movement of DNA. And uh, in this paper, uh, what they done is uh, so there is a charge, there is a potential which you're applying, right, that can control the DNA movement. And there are a couple of other uh, other techniques people tried. So, but in this case. Um, if you, they notice that if you increase the viscosity, let's say in this case they're adding actually glycerol, okay, in a solution. So if you increase the viscosity, this is centipoise viscosity units. 
then your cron drop was decreasing it means you're getting less cron drop and no no I think uh, the cron drop is this line okay now the cron drop increases it means you get a more cron drop with the viscosity and then your translocation time start getting decreasing Be previously it was 600 microseconds now that DNA which they were using in this experiment it takes about 200 microseconds so from 600 microseconds to 200 microseconds so they improved uh, no, it's lesser. Okay, no, it's not making sense so because it has to slow down. So it 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 should take longer time. So I think um, because there is no indication about what is what in this figure, unfortunately. So now I have to because with the increasing viscosity, it should slow down. So then definitely uh, for slowing down, it has to be this line. Because now from 100 microseconds, as the viscosity is increasing, you are getting 500 microseconds. So it's taking longer time to pass through the pore. So basically, you are slowing it down. And then this is a cron dip, means uh, when you're increasing the viscosity, you're, you're improving the translocation time. But on the other side, the cron dip, you know, which you get, it, also, it falls down. So basically, you get less. Uh, signal in in magnitude this is another way to show that uh, at a high viscosity I think 5.3 as compared to 1.2 centipoise uh, you can see that the, although the translocation time is is on the right side as compared to this graph so the translocation time is more but then the cron drop is also lesser so so in that way you can you can slow down DNA to some extent by by uh, making it more viscous about two times or three times, but still it's very significant, very high uh, translocation speed. Let's say from 100 microseconds to 600 microseconds or 500 microseconds, but still it's very high. Okay, but that's one way. Uh, people, this is how people looked at it, how we can control the speed. Then, uh, this is just one example as an application point of view. I think paper published in 2007 in Nature. Um, and um, uh, the one thing I just want to mention about this paper is that they have shown the application of a uh, nanopore for detecting uh, single base pair mismatches. I think there was also another paper which I showed you before. But this is another one where they use a hairpin loops. So DNA, I told you that make, they make a secondary structures. Let's say if you long segment of DNA and some bases are complementary to the other bases, so then those DNA can fold and can make a hairpin structure. Right, so because these th these sections where they make the pin structure, it makes a uh, uh, double stranded because the bases are complementary, and these are the the loop itself is single stranded. So then you can have you can design your DNA in that uh, f uh, structure based on how you decide the bases, and and then actually they made a pore in silicon dioxide. They functionalized the pore with the hairpin loop DNA, and they noticed that. And then they put a target which was only one base pair or two base pair different, and then one target was perfect complementary. And then uh, they noticed that when there is a one base mismatch, and this is a perfect complementary. So these are the pulses. So you don't get a very nice data always. Okay, so you get a very rough data, but then you have to clean up the data, so there's a lot of artificial intelligence involved later on with the, with the Oxford, how Oxford Nanopore is doing. Um, um, and so, but, but you have to clean up the data and understand this kind of pulse may be getting, you're getting from this base or that base, and then you repeat the process a couple of times, and then you ended up getting uh, good uh, sensitivity so you can predict the base that this base is it so in this case when it was a perfect complementary um, this is a perfect complementary and uh, this is their translocation time tau so it's taking about 10.2 milliseconds to pass through and when there was one base mismatch it's taking 178 milliseconds so basically uh, 
the mismatch one was taking significantly longer less from 10.2 to uh, 178 milliseconds so it's basically significantly longer time to pass through the pore so it means if there are two DNAs which is the, when there is one base mismatch so you can easily identify it uh, with this method and this graph also shows you so the red shows you one type of a signal uh, basis and then this is more translocation time so basically this is from the uh, one base mismatch and this is from perfect complementary and perfect complementary you have it they've passed through very quickly in this case okay now uh, this is very important actually the view paper uh, if you get a chance you should review it uh, uh, this paper uh, about the nanopores so so basically now how really they sequence it the question which uh, Sunday asked uh, just a few minutes back how they really get a signal so in one of the experiment this was a very important breakthrough in the article so they have used a in this field they use alpha hemolysine and in this case actually they pass single basis okay not in a, not in the form of um, dna not in the form of a polymer just a single basis let's say only a's and when they pass only A's, they notice that they were getting some specific pulse dip. Uh, like uh, the pulse, how much is closing a pore. So let's say in the case of A, which is green hair, so you, they're getting uh, pulses which are about 30 to, this I think this is the A, so about, about 30, 25 to 30. Uh, Pico amps downwards. So basically, if this is your pulse, so the how much the current is dropping, it was 30 pico amps, very small pico amperes. That's a current. Pico stands for minus 12. But when they pass T, for example, um, which is a red border hair, so you can see here also, it is about 20. Four or five, or it's different. So when you draw all those, and they notice that those pulses were easily identifiable. So when A is passing, when T is passing, G is passing, C is passing, they get the pulses, and this is how much the drop in the current you're getting. And they notice that it was significantly uh, different from each other. So you can, if the there, you, if you get a single basis, you should be able to identify them. But the problem is that, uh, so this was a very good actually uh, and that Im improve the confidence in the technology that okay so if we can identify a single basis so there is a good uh, it's a good direction so we may be ended up actually sequence the DNA when it's in a polymer form and um, so so in this case uh, but they I told you they use only one base at one time okay and then later on they mix it also and then try to get a signal from there but in this case again the one base is already passing through the port at one time and that's why there was idea to use enzyme and that can chop the bases one by one but it didn't work that well I think so in this case they used another um, MSPA this another uh, biological pore the size is a little bit smaller about 1.2 nanometer in this case yeah. so it allows only a single strand DNA pass through. So 1.2 nanometer, do you think it will allow double strand DNA to pass through? Yes or no? No. So they, it will not allow double strand DNA to pass through, right? So that's why they used another pore, which is also biological, but it only allows single strand DNA to pass through. So in this case, what they did is they designed a DNA such that like you designed DNA, so there was GGG, TTT, CCC, and like that. AAA, then GGG, and like mix, but three bases, uh, similar bases at one time. So they synthesized this DNA. So, but but not a single base, not A, T, G, C, G, A, A, not like that, but there were three bases at one time, and then another three, another, and see if we can differentiate three bases. That was a goal. But the trick they used in this case was actually let me just draw it there so let's say we have a, um, okay one two three then one and two one two three one two 
one two three one two so this is single strand let's say this is a a a this can be a t t whatever so let's put g g g for example and this this put um again a a for example okay it can be any with any sequence but then between those three three they put they synthesize such that this part is double stranded they call it a duplex so the design is such that let's say this was a, a, a and t so this is a, a at this should be a right so like that so they make this segment as a double stranded and then insert this segment between after every three bases so they synthesize this kind of a target dna so where there is some segment which is single stranded and then double strand duplex then single strand then double strand so so in this case what will happen when dna tries to pass through it so when dna passes to pass through it then you know the double stranded dna will not be able to pass through the pore so it will stop the translocation and and that time the reading which you will be getting would be from the those through uh, those uh, three bases, let's say T's or A's, which you're getting, and then there will be more voltage that will break down the single strand, double strand into single strand because of electro the voltage applied. So then it will become a single strand. Then we'll move to a next step. Again, it will be stopped at another duplex, right? And then, so you're reading in this case three bases at one time. You get a signal, and then you actually make it a single strand by applying more voltage. So the duplex is kind of, um, I would say stoppage so after every three bases stops there for some time you take a reading and then you take that the duplex off with the more potential then you lower the potential moves to the next step so in that way you can actually read three bases and then notice that those three bases if they also plot it you get a different uh, poor current means a dip in a current in that case also so from here to here that if you have three bases now in the form of a DNA but you design the DNA according to your own conditions in reality uh, so the idea was that okay if we can uh, have uh, some unknown sequence and we insert some duplex there in certain places so in that way we may be able to actually sequence the DNA step by step because in this case they were able to show that those three three bases were showing different signal so that was the goal now, but still not possible to sequence the DNA. But now, uh, how Oxford nanopores does the job? Uh, that you ha that's a question for you for the homework. Okay, it's based on very similar, and you saw how they're doing it. But you have to explain in one paragraph, and a lot of information available on their website. And also, there are some papers which they have mentioned on their website, which have cited their work. So you have to very specific. This time, if you don't get the answer, give me the right answer, you will get zero. Okay, just keep them. Just don't write. Okay, when DNA passes through it, you will get uh, pulses. And I know that. And that's already I we talk about it. So we have to specifically tell that how they were able to uh, differentiate bases from one another. Because so far, as I told you, that we are not able to differentiate, right? And I can tell you the problem. In their case, they are putting enzyme on the on the top of uh, uh, the DNA, right? In the video which you saw, and then now you can control the speed of the DNA. But the problem is, if you look at the video inside the inside the pore, at one time there are not only there is not only one base, there are multiple bases inside the pore, right? So uh, so how you, then you can sequence the DNA if there are multiple bases because the pore is thick. One base, how, how much is the difference between, physical difference between each base? 0.34, okay, uh, nanometers. So so basically if there are multiple bases, how the signal that you're getting are, are from multiple bases, right, not from a single base. So then how come you can read you, single bases? So that's the question. Okay, and before I forget, let me just uh, do that thing. Uh, 
homework four. So this comment is only for this learning students. Because if they don't watch this discussion, they might. So points are 10. Uh, Submission, no submission. Submission type uh, online. So everyone has to submit online. File upload. So you have to upload a file. Assign to everyone. And due date is. What you want? One week is good enough? It's a one one thing only, right? And you have to just write one paragraph about it. So one week. Save and publish. Let me just check it. Homework four. Okay. So make sure that you give a proper answer. Don't just uh, fill in the page. Okay. So, but, okay, there are other methods also people are exploring, especially with the graphene, new graphene. The good thing about graphene is that you have a very thin membrane, right? You can have even a layer of a single atomic layer uh, in a graphene case. So, um, and, and the people have shown in simulations, I have seen that uh, when DNA is passing through, if the, as how DNA passes through it, if you make your pore in a graphene, it's graphene-based nanopores, then it means the thickness of the membrane in which you're making a pore is very, very small. It's just a one atomic layer. So it means at one time, there will be only very few, maybe one or two bases only inside the pore at that time. So the signal which you'll be getting maybe only coming from only those two three bases so or even one base so so it means there are chances that you can resolve that issue that not more than a couple of bases in the pore but right now if you use a 50 nanometers it, it will fill up with a lot of pore, uh, bases in the biological nanopores also they have more bases because if you look at their length let's say the one pore which we were looking at uh, let's say in this case uh, at one time, it's a 5 nanometer, right, on this side, and this may be also 4 or 5 nanometers. So this is also 10 nanometer approximately. Okay, so it means at one time there are more than one basis inside a pore, and that's a problem. So the people thought, okay, why not we can use graphene, and after graphene, people got a Nobel Prize, and everyone started working on graphene, and people also started exploring graphene for nanopore sensing, and uh, it seems like to me it's a good application. That uh, because it's very thin, so uh, and they have shown theoretically. I have seen some simulations that as DNA is passing through, you can look at one or two bases one time, and you signal you can get it. But in the, um, with the experiments, I have not seen any paper still where people have shown the graphene that they can sequence the DNA. Okay, but this is another way to go uh, in that area because you can make a very thin membrane, and the pore thickness is very. And then again, making a pore is, a, uh, is using FIB or uh, transmission electron microscope electron focusing. Okay, that's about the nanopore so far. Um, and then all, I will just briefly go through um, in today's lecture because I noticed that we will finish up uh, liberally. So I added some section about the proteins. Uh, we did talk about DNA a lot and sequencing. And uh, now I thought, okay, I'll give you some background information about uh, the proteins. Uh, which many people from biology or chemistry, they might already know about it, but for other people it's very important. Um, so so the, the proteins is also uh, a polymer, right? Uh, and the proteins can be uh, in the form of enzymes. Uh, you might find it, and they can be um, antigens, they can be um, um, antibodies, so all are proteins. They have amino acids. So they're about 20 to 22. 
amino acids uh, uh, or 21 amino acids uh, in total. Those are the building blocks. And uh, those amino acids, how they are arranged and based on their length, uh, you can have different proteins. Okay? And uh, synthesized inside your body. I told you that all the genetic information is stored in, in the DNA, right? So when the gene is need to be expressed, the information is copied in the form of a messenger RNA. So the RNA actually goes outside the nucleus and copies that information from a DNA and goes to ribosomes. And based on that sequence, then the amino acids are synthesized. Let's say there's ATC, different amino acids are synthesized. If there is a TDA, then different amino acids is uh, synthesized. So in that way, three bases of a DNA actually des decide what amino acids uh, would be uh, synthesized in ribosomes. And now those amino acids are synthesized of different types. And how many different types? 20, 21 different types. Okay, so because why I say 20, 21, 22? Because um, in, uh, in literature, normally people think there are 20 amino, different amino acids present, but there are one or two more amino acids discovered. They are not present in every animal. Uh, eukaryotic or prokaryotic cells, but they are present in some of them in bacteria, so that's why I'm just saying it. In total, there might be uh, 22, but but the 20 is present in almost all the proteins. So, so, so basically, um, those 20 uh, different amino acids are uh, synthesized, and then they combine with each other. And, and then they actually make a protein based on how long they are. So can you tell me how many different proteins we can have with the amino acids? With the 20 different amino acids, let's say? How many, like in the DNA, right? I told you that we have four bases. In this case, we have 20 different amino acids which we can use to build the proteins. So how many different proteins we can have? Theoretically. No. Yeah. Unlimited. Because I'm not restricting the length of the amino acids. So at each place there can be 20 different, right? And now the place is how many? It can be longer or smaller. I, I, I said, look, okay, I didn't restrict you on the length. So it means you can have, if you don't restrict the length, you can have unlimited number of different proteins synthesized. But their basic building blocks are 20 different amino acids. The name is, uh, so uh, so there are different, like we said more than, most of the uh, proteins are more than 100 base uh, uh, amino acids long, so then we call it a protein. If it's less small fragment, we call it a polypeptide, or if it's less than 10 amino acids, people normally call it a peptide, so okay. So that's just a differentiation about the length, but normally proteins are more than 100 uh, amino acids long. And the name itself is very interesting. It says amino acid. So do you know when we say acidic acid, what group is attached with that? C double O H. Right? Acidic. So it means it's amino acid. So at one side it has a C double O H group. And there is amino amine. Amine is what? N H two. So it has a at one side it has an amine group which is N H two. And on the other side it has an acidic acid group uh, or hydroxyl the C double O H group. So you have amine and C double OH. And if you look at the structure, that's very interesting. So this is how the amino acid looks like, single amino. So you, at one side you have a C double OH, at the other side you have a NH2, but it's now making a uh, bond with a, third, uh, with a third hydrogen, but basically it's NH2 or NH3 with a plus because of the hydrogen. So you have a carboxylic group on one side, amino group on the other side, and there's only one carbon there, okay? With one carbon, there's always one hydrogen, so only this part is different, which is your side chain. So based on, let's say in the bases you have ATGC, right? So most of part is similar except the base is different. In this case, all of part is similar except this side chain would be different. And that will determine the type of amino acids, okay? So it means you can have, you can have 20 different types of side chains. 
and that will define if it's different amino acid or not. And I'll show you how now you have amino acids, how they can combine to make a protein in just a few seconds. Okay, before we start looking at different amino acids and side chains, let's look at the one comparison. I noticed that it's a very interesting comparison, how DNA and computer are similar. If we look at the DNA, we have a chromosome, right, where most of the DNA is stored, right? And floppy disk is a pretty old table. You, some of you might not, I don't know, I know about the floppy disk, I have seen it, I have used it. Is there anyone in the room who has not used a floppy disk? Okay, so maybe uh, we are from the same uh, time frame. Uh, with a little bit difference in uh, age. So, but basically, uh, nowadays I don't think you can find a floppy disk anywhere. Uh, but there used to be a small disk which can store some, I don't know how much was storage. One MB or kilo kilobytes? I don't remember. 128 MB or KB? MB, okay. So it was very small storage disk. Um, so, but, and we can now, let's say, instead of floppy disk, we can say a hard disk, okay, nowadays. Hard disk, it can store a few terabytes or something, and chromosome, you can also store a lot of information. In chromosome, some part of a chromosome is called a gene, right, some segment of it. In this case, we can call it a file. In a computer, you can have thousands or millions of different files, right, and each file have different information. And again, in the gene, so there are also thousands of different genes, uh, which is just a part of that chromosome. So that gene, okay, now when you write a file, um, the file is written in the form of byte. When you talk about the people who are in computer science, they will know that byte is 8-bit, right? And the bytes are, in, in a computer, in reality, the information is stored in bytes, in bits, like so 1, 2, so 8, 8, 8 bits makes 1 byte, and that's how the uh, information is stored there on a hard disk, because if there's a written for example, I won't go to school on your Word document. It doesn't mean that it is stored like that. It is converted into a digital format, and, and then the information is stored in the bytes, in the ones and zeros. So you have a byte. In this case, we have a codon, which is three bases. It means three bases can make one amino acid. Okay, so those three bases, which are codons, like that gene, some part of a gene is actually can be expressed in a codon, which is three, three amino acids, uh, three Bases can be uh, used to synthesize one amino acid. So that, that is called codon. Three bases represents one amino acid. So, but in, in computer, we have bytes. And now, in the DNA, we have bases, which are four different bases, four types. In the computer, we have zero and one. So we have information stored as zero and one. In that other case, we have ATGC. So when we talk about the mutation in the DNA, it means something has changed, which was not supposed to be that way. And in computer, we call it as a corrupted file, right? The file is corrupted. It means something went wrong with the file. And that's where, in DNA, we call it as a mutation. So something changed and in the sequence, and that's why now your cells is not behaving the way it should. In cancer cells, is also because of the mutations and all that. So there is definitely some relevance uh, between those two different technologies. Okay, now let's look at the, some different amino acids. So there are some amino acids which are charged, so they are either positively charged or negatively charged. And, uh, and for example, in this case, if you look at this amino acid, so you have a NH3 group at one side, COOH at one side, and CH on the other side, and then this C now, uh, this group is attached, okay? Uh, and then if you look at this group, it has NH2 plus, so there's a plus charge, so that's why the overall charge on the this amino acid would be positive charge. This is also positive, I will not go into detail about each and every different, but I will just want to show you that there are some amino acids which are positively charged, it makes the amino acids positively charged because these are side chains. They all are mostly hydrocarbons. And some are negatively charged based on the charge of a functional group. Some of them are actually not charged, let's say in this case, but they show uh, polar bonds, means they show partial positive and negative like in a water because of hydrogen bonding. So they have partial positive and negative charge. 
and, and that's why they can make actually bond with other groups. And there are some other amino acids which are non-polar, they are hydrophobic, so they are not charged, they are neutral. By the way, the, there is one term very important for final exam, it's called the isoelectric point, we also call it a PI. So when I say the protein is, let's say if you take a protein, not amino acid, and it's charged, so the isoelectric point, so iso means similar, electric means electrically similar, means neutral. So it is the pH of a solution where the per charge on the protein is neutral. That's called the isoelectric point. Let's say if I say the isoelectric point of this protein is 5. What does it, that mean? It means that 5 pH, the charge on this protein would be zero. Now if you increase the pH to six or seven, the, this protein will start becoming negatively charged. Okay, if you decrease the pH to four and three, it becomes positively charged. So you can control the charge based on the pH of a solution. Okay, and that is very important when you're doing experiments with the nanopores and we want to move proteins from one place to the other side. So you need to know the isoelectric point of the protein because you might think it's a five, but and based on that you have to adjust your buffer condition so that the protein can move from negative to positive or positive to negative terminal, right? In the nanopore setting, for example. And also in the other gels, you also need to know there what is the isoelectric point. So that's a, another term which is important from example of you also and also in general. Um, and there are some amino acids which are non-polar. It means they are not charged. They are hydrophobic. And there are some special cases that, do you remember this group, SH, thiol group? So it means if you have this amino acid, it can bind with which material very efficiently? Thiol binds with silver, gold, or titanium. Which one? Gold. So thiol always binds very well with the gold. Okay, so so just so there are, they they have some special functions basically, um, but they are in total. Let's see how many we discussed: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Okay, these are the most twenty which are found most in most of the organisms themselves. Okay, now let's say you have two amino acids. So this is how the amino acid looks like. You have an NH3 group on one side. You have C-O-O-H group on the other side, or C-O-O with the minus charge. You have a hydrogen on one side, and the functional group, which is represented with the R, which shows that it's a different amino acid. And there's another amino acid in solution, let's say, a very similar configuration. But now the C-O and this H. So the O and H actually uh, show chemical reaction. They, they make a, a peptide linkage. They make a, a what kind of a bond? Uh, I forgot. Peptide bond. I think it's called the peptide bond. <laughs> yeah, peptide linkage. And, uh, and the bond itself is characterized as a peptide bond because it's uh, used to make the proteins. So basically, this CWH from one side binds with the NH3H from the other side. So this H and O combines to make H2O, they also take one H from the water because they're dissolved in water, so they make H2O. So when they make H2O, that means there will be a linkage, so this will be released, and then C will directly make a bond with the N in this case, and that, that's called the peptide linkage. So now these two amino acids are connected with one another, okay? And why we are connecting amino acids to make? Protein, because protein composed of many amino acids. So if you look at the amino acid, it's a, uh, the peptide linkage between a carbon and nitrogen, right? So now if I go to this structure, this is one, uh, this is second amino acid, third. So this is between carbon and nitrogen, carbon and nitrogen. So the red here, the red bar shows you the linking, the peptide bond, carbon, nitrogen. So in that way, the if you have a lot of amino acids, they can combine with one another, make a bonds, peptide bonds, and you can make a long chain of it, right? And a solution. And now those, if you have this type of structure, and now you have another same, similar type of structure, 
where, where you have a long chain of single amino acids and you leave them in a solution. So what happens that, okay, what is this? Nitrogen, right? This nitrogen, you have nitrogen here and you also have, oh no, this is oxygen. So the oxygen and you also have a nitrogen here. This is nitrogen. So this oxygen and nitrogen actually starts showing the hydrogen bonding. So basically, this one strip, when you, show, when you let them um, sit in a water, they start showing hydrogen bonding, like how the DNA shows bonding between AATs and GCs, right? That's also hydrogen bonding. Because you have a nitrogen and oxygen, they show the hydrogen bonding. And that makes a 2D structure now. So it was a 1D, let's say, now they start making a layers of each other, so they make a 2D. They sometimes make a 2D in this sheet, it's called the beta sheets. They also are present in the alpha helix form, where you, there are actually three different, at certain angle they show hydrogen bonding. So they can make different forms of structures in the 2D. And then those structures can also, those structures, um, so this is the say beta sheet, this is the alpha helix, another form, but again the amino acids, how they are making hydrogen bonds. And they can combine with each other with the disulfide bond to make a more complex 3D structure. Okay, and those structures actually then can combine to make a subunits of a protein. So basically, then you have a more complex structure of a protein, which is all around and folded. So just give you one example. This is a hemoglobin, okay, found in a blood of every human being. If you're a vampire, then maybe not, right? So then in this case you have a hemoglobin then it has different proteins and it has different subunits let's say in this case there were subunits one two three four in this case there are also subunits and this is alpha subunit and this is beta beta means the beta sheets alpha means alpha helix form subunits and there is also heme group there so that's why we call it a hemoglobin and there are four different globes, so we call it a hemoglobin. So this is how the protein is much folded. It's not just a straight. It's a 3D structure. It's very complex, and it takes a much more effort to resolve that structure. Also, people use the crystallization, X-ray crystallography, and all that. Also, to resolve how those different amino acids, how long is there, how many amino acids are involved in making the structure, and if you know the structure, how they will fold. Okay, and so that's what it comes. Each protein is folded differently, and this is how the protein looks like uh, theoretically. Do you know how much would be the size of this hemoglobin approximately? I know I didn't tell you before, but I will give you some range: one nanometer, five nanometer, fifty nanometer, hundred nanometer, or five hundred nanometer. One five fifty, hundred five hundred. One. Okay. One answer is one. Anyone else with any other answers? Yeah, just at least you can tell me, okay, what numbers cannot be true? One, five, fifty, hundred, and five hundred nanometers. So which number is not correct, which is totally out of range? Five hundred, yeah, that seems to be a very big number, so it's not. Definitely proteins are not five hundred nanometer big. So that's hundred. Yeah, 100 is also seems to me out of a range. Uh, it's also not, I don't think there's a protein which is 100 nanometer big. There might be one, but I don't know. Most of them are not 100 nanometer. They are smaller because 100 nanometer is a virus size is 100 nanometer. So, uh, 1, 5, and 50. So which option seems to be still out of a range slightly? 50 is towards the upper border, actually. Yeah, there are some proteins which are present 50. One seems to me out of range. So one nanometer is too small. <laughs> it's too small. So five and 50 are actually in a good range. The most of the proteins are between five and 50 nanometers, which are found in the human body. Most of them are from in that range. It can be six, seven, 10, 11, 15, 20, and most of them are in this range, nanometers, okay? So this one specifically is about five nanometers, okay?
Okay, structure and function of different uh, proteins, the uh, specific shape and functional groups actually of the proteins allow them to bind non-covalently with other molecules. I told you that antigens are also made up of proteins, the antibodies are. So when you have antibodies, they are very complex, they have a certain shape. So they can bind very specifically with specific proteins. And But they all are made up of amino acids. But how they are folded, they show very specific binding to a certain antigen. Okay, let's say if it's an EGFR, if it's a Zika virus or HIV related protein, then the antibodies which are formed, they normally show very good specificity to bind with only those antigens or proteins. Okay, in that way you can capture them from a blood or saliva or urine sample. And in that way also you can design antibodies. I think uh, it's done.